Amen. Well, it is so good to see you today. I'm so glad to be able to be here. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 17. Uh, Luke 17, we are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And for the rest of 2022, we'll be preaching and teaching from the gospel of Luke. Now, if you did not bring a Bible with you today, that is A-OK. There's a Bible under the seat in front of you. Reach underneath that seat, grab the Bible, and turn to page 1,000. 41. That's where, where you will find Luke chapter 17. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily in your home, please take one of our Bibles home with you. We want you to have a copy of God's Word in your house, not to set out whenever the pastor comes over, uh, not to use as a coaster or a leveler on your table. We want you to have a copy of God's Word so you will read it and apply it to your life. Because at Calvary, we firmly believe that if we read God's Word, it's not enough. But reading and applying His Word to our lives changes our lives. And if you want to experience a relationship with your heavenly father, begin by applying his word and you will experience life change. Now, if you did not realize it, I recognize that some of you in here may not be aware this past week in Havasu, it was fall break. Um, Parents know that it was. Students know that it was fall break. My family was blessed to be gifted a week in Newport Coast. We had an incredible fall break. We were swimming and we were roller skating and we were uh, building campfires on the beach, pumpkin patch stuff. It was so good for us to be away together as a family. But you know what's great about being gone? Coming home, right? Being able to come home and sleep in your own bed and be able to just be in your own home before the madness of the school year resumes. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you you probably already realize that you and I as followers of Jesus have so much to be thankful for in our lives. Yet, even if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, that may change today. You may become a follower of Christ today at the end of our service. But even if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, most likely you have so much to be thankful for in your life. Did you know that you are among the wealthiest people on the planet? Now, I know that with inflation and rising interest rates and the cost of housing, you may not feel like you are the wealthiest people on the planet, but you are. So I I want you to help me out here by raising your hand. I'm going to read several statements. And what I'd love for you to do is if you can agree with that statement, just simply raise your hand. So raise your hand if today, right now, you have food in your refrigerator. Not hard, right? Raise your hand if you have more clothes at home than what you personally have on your back. (laughs) Raise your hand if you have a place to sleep tonight. Raise your hand if that place has a roof over your head. Okay, see if you raised your hand for all of those, you are among the wealthiest top 25% in the world. Like you're among the wealthiest people in the world if you could say yes to those statements. And and let me raise the stake just a little bit more. If in addition, raise your hand if you have a little bit of money in the bank. I didn't say much, just a little bit. Raise your hand if you have spare change, maybe at home, in the car, in your pocket. And raise your hand if you have any amount of money in your wallet or your purse. See, If you were able to raise your hand to those as well, you're among the top 8% wealthiest people in the world. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way for you, but that is a reality that regardless of what you experience in this life, if you were able to agree with those statements, then you're among the top 25 or top uh, 25 to top 8% of the wealthiest people on the planet. And we lose sight of that sometimes because we get focused in on our troubles. 
We get focused in on our, our uh, challenges that we're facing at home or at work or wherever it is. We fail to remember how blessed we are because we zero in on ourselves. And we tend to focus on what we do not have as opposed to what we have. And when we fail to focus in on what we already have, we tend to not be as grateful as we should be as followers of Jesus and just as people in general. In today's passage of scripture that we're gonna take a look at in Luke chapter 17, there were 10 people that immediately had their lives changed and transformed by Jesus. And of those 10, only one showed any type of gratitude to Jesus. Only one demonstrated any type of, man, I'm so glad Jesus has changed my life. Only one returned to say thank you to him. Let's read together Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his feet, uh, he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. So we have these 10 people who are changed, these 10 people who are transformed, yet only one recognizes it, turns back and says, thank you to Jesus. Now, as we talk about in Luke, especially as we look at the miracles, it's so important that you and I really understand the context. Leprosy, when we say that word out loud, you and I don't understand it in the same way that culture understood leprosy back then. Back then, leprosy was a terrible disease. It was a life sentence. But when you, from the very first moment you were diagnosed with leprosy, your clothes, your possessions, your bedding was burned. It was completely taken away. You were disowned by your family. You were shunned for the rest of your life until you died. Kind of like the early days of COVID, if you remember that. <laughs> Whether you were young or old, rich or poor, you were shunned by friends, by family in the community. You were left to huddle with other people who were just like you. They, they essentially had leper colonies that they would force people who had leprosy into. If you had this disease, your friends and family shunned you. Everything that you had in life was burned or destroyed and you were forced to go live in a leper colony, begging for food and struggling to hang on just for a Another day. And to make matters worse, as they would move from town to town or village to village, as they walked along the road, they had to ring a bell as they went their way, and they had to warn everybody not to come near them by yelling the, the words, unclean, unclean. And their condition didn't get any better. It's not as if they were diagnosed with a cold or a virus that just had to run through their system. Their condition worsened every single day. They grew more grotesque, they grew more diseased, and in leper, leper colonies, they literally watched each other rot away. They would watch each other go blind. They would watch each other lose limbs. They would watch fingers and toes rot and fall off. They would see wounds that wouldn't heal. 
they would watch one another slowly die of either leprosy or starving to death. Can you imagine life like that? Can you imagine them huddled together with their diseased and broken bodies watching the outside world interact with each other? Watching fathers and sons walking together back from the fields after working all day. Watching mothers with their children and interacting with them. Can you imagine what it was like to see other people go to the temple to worship and know that because of their disease, they were not able to go into the temple for worship? I would imagine that if I had leprosy, I would wish I could be like somebody else for a day so that maybe somebody might hug me or maybe somebody would smile at me or maybe somebody would pat me on the back and say, attaboy, great job, love having you around. But instead, they had to watch normal, healthy people from the outside. That's the context that we have to understand this passage of scripture. Because when Jesus cleansed them, when Jesus removed their leprosy, he didn't just make them better, he gave them back their lives. He gave them something that they had been missing for years and years. See, if we don't understand the the context, if we don't understand the context, then we're never going to understand the point of what Jesus was trying to make in this passage. So together we see them standing at a distance as Jesus entered the village. They're grotesque, they've got their clothes on, they're bent over, they're hobbling. And in unison, when they see Jesus, they put their, their diseased voices graveling together And they lift them up and say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And the moment Jesus saw them, not even without taking a step towards them, he told them to go show themselves to the priests. Well, why did he do that? There was an Old Testament law that if anybody who had a skin disease believed that they had been healed, they were to go show themselves to the priest and the priest would give them permission to come back into society. In other words, they'd go to the priest and say, hey, remember that bad skin disease I had here on my arm? It's gone. The priest would look, say, okay, welcome back to society. And he would declare them to be clean. Jesus told them to go show themselves to the priests because he'd already healed them. And it was as they were walking, can you imagine that picture? Like what an incredible movie scene in real life as these 10 lepers start making their way to the priests, they begin to realize that they're healed. How do they realize that? Well, the foot grew back, number one, right? They're not hobbling anymore. They're actually walking straight. They're able to stand up. Their fingers and their toes are there. They're able to see eyesight wise. They're looking at one another and they're seeing, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, that person has been changed. They're looking at their hands. They realize they have been made whole. Those scabby patches of skin were gone and they were cleansed. They were no longer unclean. They would never have to ring a bell again. They were cleansed. The gratitude that should have been overwhelming flowing out of each of the tens lives, I mean, it should have just been amazing. There should have been an eruption of praise. There should have been this celebration for all that God did because they got their lives back. They would be able to reunite with their family. They'd be able to reunite with their friends and their children. They'd be able to rejoin society and they'd be able to work with their hands. They'd be able to walk up and down the streets and make eye contact with people. They could go back to living and enjoying their lives as they once had before the disease had taken their life from them. And if you're a follower of Jesus, 
You came to a moment where you knew you needed the cleansing power of Jesus to change your life. You understood the ugliness of your sin. You understood that your sin separated you from that relationship with God. But Jesus' death on the cross paid the price for your sin. And through his blood, you were cleansed from that sin and you were made new. You surrendered your life to Jesus and you committed your life to following him. You demonstrated what it was like to be changed. So learn from the lepers that a life-changing relationship with God is demonstrated through gratitude. A relationship, a life-changing relationship with God is demonstrated through gratitude. And every miraculous event, every time Jesus healed somebody, we see gratitude from those who were healed. They fall at his feet. They follow Jesus down the road. They get up and dance. They joyfully run around. But nine of these men in the midst of their joy did not demonstrate any gratitude. They were so self-absorbed in their own happiness, they didn't bother to thank the source of their healing. And as God blesses you as a follower of Jesus, just as God blesses you every single day, whether it's a meal, whether it's a paycheck, whether it's a friend or a family, the challenge is be thankful, be grateful. God has provided for you. Before you ask him for something else, demonstrate gratitude with how he's already blessed you. Uh, before you call out to him and ask him for another thing in your life, another blessing, make sure that you're living with a thankful, grateful heart for what God has done in your life. And if you've received forgiveness for your sins, if you're already a follower of Jesus, try to imagine what your life would be like if you never surrendered your life to Christ. Try to imagine where you would be today if you had never committed your life to following Jesus. Maybe you didn't meet your spouse until after you gave your life to Christ. You committed your life to following Jesus. You start going to church. You met your spouse there in life group or you met your spouse at worship. Or maybe the friends and the family that you surround yourself today are completely the opposite of who you once were but you're demonstrating Christ-centered values, that you're, you're trying to grow in grace and kindness and mercy and forgiveness, and you're surrounding yourself with other people who are like that. Your life is completely different than what it was before you gave your life to Jesus. See, Jesus didn't just forgive you of your sins like Figuratively speaking, he did the lepers. The lepers were cleansed of their disease. We were cleansed of our sin, but it didn't stop there. See, Jesus actually, when he forgives, you of your, uh, forgives us of our sins and cleanses us, he gives us a whole different life. He gives us a whole different path to follow. Now, it doesn't mean that your life won't have its ups and downs. We still live in a world surrounded by sinners. We still live in a, a place surrounded by sinners. And we still sin. It doesn't mean that there won't be ups and downs in our lives. But as we walk through the hard, as we walk through the difficulties in our lives, let's choose to walk through them with happy, joyful hearts. Because a lack of gratitude is destructive and selfish. A lack of gratitude is destructive and selfish. Look at what Jesus said. He said to the leper, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? See, I think those 10 men or those other nine, They'd focused on their sickness for so long. Now they were only focused on their sickness disappearing. 
and not on the one that healed them, not on the one that took their sickness away. And that's what Jesus found disappointing. They were focused more on how they were being blessed than the one who gave the blessing. And I think that we have a tendency to do the very same thing. We focus on the blessing that God provides to us, but we don't focus on God himself. We, we often don't return daily to God to give thanks, heartfelt thanks for all the ways that he has blessed us in our lives because we're focused on what we receive as opposed to the one who is blessing us. We demonstrate, I think, an attitude of ungratitude oftentimes. And that's where it gets dangerous. That's where it gets dangerous for followers of Jesus. That's where it gets dangerous for people in general. Listen to the words that the apostle Paul wrote about people who live with ingratitude in their hearts. He said this in the letter uh, to the Romans, Romans 1 verse 21 through 24 roughly. As he talked about people who were ungrateful, he said, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. That sounds like the nine. They knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. See, Paul explained that the reason why these people became dark and confused is because they refused, one of the key reasons, they refused to give God thanks. They knew who he was, but they wouldn't worship him. They knew what he could do, but they wouldn't give God thanks. And because of ingratitude, God abandoned those people. Because of ingratitude, their minds became dark and confused. Now, as parents, we try to teach our kids to say thank you, right? That's, that's one of the things that we like our kids to do. If we do something for them, if we go out of our way, if we serve them and show them overwhelming kindness, we want them to say, thanks, dad. Thanks, mom. We appreciate that. But we can always tell when they're being sincere, right? Like if the sisters do something nice for each other, we say, hey, make sure you say thank you. Thank you, right? It's not sincere. And so you want, what you want to do is, okay, say it again. Like that, that doesn't help, right? Saying it again, well, thanks. Okay, now I'll say it sincerely. Thank you, right? But, but their heart, their, they, their heart, nothing changed in their hearts. They're not really grateful. We're just trying to get them to appear grateful, right? If you want to destroy a relationship with your spouse, if you want to destroy a relationship with a family member or a coworker, just never say thank you. Never demonstrate that you appreciate them for anything. If you want to destroy a relationship, never show gratitude to somebody else. So that's the key to destroying a relationship. The key to not destroying relationships is showing gratitude, right? It's expressing how much you appreciate and value other people. People in your lives, if you're a follower of Jesus, should not feel unappreciated. I mean, we, we ought to be going out of our way to appreciate and value those around us. A lack of gratitude is selfish and destructive and it will come back to destroy you. So remember, God's forgiveness and grace is more than enough reason to live thankfully. God's forgiveness and his grace is more than enough reason to live thankfully. I love what Jesus didn't do with the nine. I love what he didn't do. Did he destroy them? Did he look at them and say, fine, you're not gonna thank me? Boom, you got leprosy again. <laughs> Give me back that foot, right? He didn't demonstrate that. 
Jesus did not return the leprosy to the ungrateful nine. He didn't take away their healing. And that reminds me, and I want to encourage you in this, even when you and I are at our worst, Jesus does not take away our forgiveness. Even when you and I are at our very worst in our lives as followers of Jesus, Jesus doesn't sit back and say, boom, I take away your grace. I take away forgiveness of sins. You're now black as you've ever been. You're just a, your heart's just empty and black and bad, right? He didn't say that. We continue to be cleansed. We continue to be purified. We continue to have a right relationship with God. He shows us grace. He shows us mercy. He doesn't take away our forgiveness. And it reminds me of those amazing words from Romans 8, where Paul said, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, nor angels or demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've committed your life to him, if you've been changed and transformed from the inside out, you will never be separated from God's love. Jesus demonstrated that toward these nine. He didn't give them back their leprosy because he was dissatisfied with them. He allowed them to live out the remainder of their days experiencing his mercy and grace anyway. Even if they were unthankful, even if they were not grateful, God continued to allow them, Jesus continued to allow them to live under his grace and mercy and healing. That type of grace that should make our hearts burst with gratitude. That type of kindness and love that God has for us, it's a life-changing love. It's an unearned love. It's a love that you and I probably could never reciprocate wholly in this life. I can't love Jesus as much as he loves me. It reminds me of a, a moment right after our wedding when Christy and I, we exited the worship center. We said, I do. We exited the worship center, turned the corner from where anybody could see. I looked at my wife, who's now my, you know, my recently married wife. I looked at Christy. I pulled her tight. I put my head on, down on her shoulder and I cried. It wasn't a long cry, but it was a brief cry because I could not believe she loved me enough to marry me. I felt special. I, I was overwhelmed by her love for me. I didn't feel lovable, yet she loved me and she had just committed to remain at my side for better or worse in sickness and in health until we were separated by death. She could have married anybody else, but she chose me. And I couldn't believe that she loved me that much. Her love humbled me and it created in me a debt of gratitude. Jesus loved these men that even though they didn't return to give him thanks, even though they didn't return to say thank you, they experienced the debt being made whole, right? They, they experienced the forgiveness of life. They were given a second chance, a do-over, and they got to experience that. I want you to know that that same second chance that they experienced in life, they experienced it physically. You can experience it spiritually today. 
The lepers were changed on the outside, but you can be changed on the inside. You can be forgiven for your sin. You can be made new. You can receive a second chance at life. And if you would like to surrender your life to Jesus, if you would like to receive his grace and his mercy, if you want that type of life-changing relationship with Jesus, if you want to invite him to change the direction and the course of your life, our prayer team is going to be here at the close of the last song. They would love to talk to you. They would love to help you discover a relationship with Jesus. They would love to help you start over. And if that, if that uh, closing song, the coming down front and talking to the prayer team, if that's too much, tomorrow night or Sunday night, celebrate recovery. Come on out to celebrate recovery. If there's bad habits that you have, if there's hurts that you have in your life, hangups that you have in your life, experience a second chance. Whether it happens at the close of today's service, whether it's on Monday night and celebrate recovery, whether it's involved in getting with a life group, take a second chance. Get involved. Ask God to bless you and ask God to help you. And as you do that and you experience his grace and his mercy, show it with a grateful, thankful heart. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your grace and your goodness that you demonstrate to our lives. Thank you that as you healed these 10 lepers, you healed them all. Not just the one that came back to say thanks, you changed them all. Father, Help us to learn this lesson, to live gratefully, to live thankfully, to live joyfully as followers of Christ. Keep changing us, keep transforming us, and keep helping us to live thankfully. Help us to have the happy hearts that you designed us to have. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.